Hi, Larry Alterman here, and today I'm going to be talking about this Blackbird vehicle, which is a wind-powered vehicle. And there's some controversy surrounding this vehicle, and some videos have been made about this vehicle, and I will be talking about that today. Now, the interesting thing about this vehicle is that supposedly it can travel downwind faster than the speed of wind. So the wind might be only 10 miles an hour, and yet they claim that the vehicle can go up to 25 mile an hour downwind. So there's this debate, some controversy surrounding this. Some people say, is this possible? How can something go downwind faster than the wind is pushing it? it intuitively, it makes no sense. And some people don't believe that Blackbird did what it was supposed to have done. So into this debate comes this YouTuber, this famous YouTuber named Vertasium a.k.a. Derek Mueller. And he's, uh, you can look how he has 9.6 million subscribers. He's rich. He's famous. He has a Ph.D. in physics. He's handsome. He's tall, personable. Basically, I, everything I wish I was. But uh, never mind that. That's not important here. But let's go on. So uh, he came into this debate and said, uh, I'm going to go down there and see if it's really true. I'm going to prove that it's really true or prove that it's not true. I'm going to settle this debate. So he made this video about this where he goes down there and he actually rides in the car and he takes measurements. He brings scientific instruments and he proves that indeed this vehicle can go faster than the wind. But then supposedly he gets this call from this professor, this UCLA, UCLA professor named Alex Kusenko. And supposedly this professor says, I don't believe you. I don't believe this is true. I've thought about this problem. I've done some calculations, and it's not possible to go faster than the wind. And, um, and supposedly uh, Vertasium says, oh, yeah? If that's what you really believe, then let's bet about it. Let's bet $10,000. And supposedly this professor says, okay, and they bet $10,000. Now, uh, I have nothing against this guy, Fertissium, David Muller. He seems like a nice guy, and he does a lot of good things. But I'm going to call you out, Mr. Fertissium. I don't believe for one second that this was a real bet. I believe, and I'm almost 100% sure, that this was just a publicity stunt. Now, how do I know this? Well, first of all, this guy, Alex Kusenko, I did some looking up on him, and he's a very smart guy, theoretical physicist, astrophysicist. He's written articles like Sterile Neutrinos, Dark Matter, and Pulsar, pulsar Velocities in Models with Higgs Singlet. So uh, he, he is no, he's no dummy. And yet, the concept of faster than wind has been around for quite a while. So uh, as Vertesium himself points out, there was an article way back in 1978 that uh, showed the physics of, of a boat that could go faster than, than the wind, which is the same thing as a car that could go faster than the wind, except it's in water instead of in, uh, on, on land. And one of the things he says of this is the resulting analysis is instructive and suitable for an undergraduate physics course, an undergraduate physics course. So what he's saying is basically, this is, a f this is fun physics for undergraduate physicists. Uh, for people that really don't know physics that much, they can learn something from this. It's basically what he's saying is that this is kind of an obvious problem. Now, in addition to this, as again, Vertissium points it out, in the... Uh, 2013 competition with the Olympiad, uh, one of the questions they asked was about the uh, this boat, which is built way, I mean, this uh, vehicle, the, the Blackbird, which is built way back in 2009. And they ask uh, questions about, they, they, they show what the boat claims, the vehicle claims it can do, and they ask, is this possible? And if it's possible, uh, show the physics that shows that it's possible. And of course, uh, they knew what the answer was before they posted this question, because you always, when you post a question on a test, you always know the answer ahead of time. And of course, the answer is this. Faster than wind is possible 
Furthermore, with sufficiently low energy loss, any speed is possible. So what do they mean by that, energy loss? Well, energy loss translates to friction. They're saying without friction, any speed is possible. And this brings up an interesting point. Here on Earth, we cannot get away from friction. There's friction everywhere. And it's hard to think of things without friction. We're so used to it that it just is a part of our life. If we go out into space, we can see satellites that go around the Earth forever because there's no friction. But here on Earth, there's always friction. And so we, when we want to think about things that are theoretically possible, we have to think about what's possible without friction. And sometimes if you think about it without friction, you realize that the answer becomes quite obvious. So um, I'm quite sure that this Professor Alex knew that indeed it was theoretically uh, possible. And in addition to that, later on in this video, I will present my own explanation, uh, my own argument for why this is possible. And in my argument, unlike many of the other arguments, I will be not using fancy math and equations. I will be using very physics, very basic physics with no equations, and I will make it very clear and very intuitive that faster than wind is indeed possible. Okay, so let's talk about the bet some more. First of all, I'm sure that some money did actually change hands. In order to make the bet uh, look realistic, they had to actually uh, pay up. Otherwise, uh, if, they found, if people found out that the, the money didn't change hands, that could be a big problem for them. So I'm sure money actually did change hands. But that being said, uh, I don't think that means much. Let's look at this bet from two points of view, a business personal point of view and a technical point of view. First, let's talk about the business personal point of view. Uh, first of all, I think it's kind of silly. I mean, I, I doubt there was any real stress on the part of either party about this bet. I mean, if I lost uh, a $10,000 bet, I would be depressed for months. But what does uh, Vertissium care about a $10,000 bet when he's going to make $100,000 or $200,000 or $300,000 from this video? I mean, the video has already like 8 million views. Uh, from the professor's point of view, I doubt that that came from his own pocket either. I'm sure the university paid for the publicity and, or something like that. Or by the way, they made a big point about the fact that they signed this legal document. But they didn't say exactly what was in the document. Perhaps something look, perhaps the document looked something like this. Uh, perhaps they, they made it sound like the document was a, it was a good thing, but perhaps it was uh, kind of like the opposite in terms of uh, proving that it was uh, a real situation. In any case, I doubt that either party was worried or stressed about losing any money. OK, but never mind about the business point of view. Let's now talk about the technical aspects of this bet. What were they actually betting? Well, they were supposed to be betting on the theoretical possibility of a faster than a wind car. The professor claimed that he didn't believe it, that he did some analysis, he looked at some equations, and he didn't think that faster than wind was possible. But did they really bet on the theoretics of whether this was possible? No, they didn't. Because if they were to do that, they would have to prove it with an analysis and proof that physicists could agree on. So what the bet came down to instead was this controlled lab experiment. They were to build a scale model in this lab setting. And the professor said that to prove, for, him, for them to prove to him that it was possible to do this uh, faster than wind machine, they would, they would have to show on a treadmill that uh, this scale model could go uh, up forward against the, the motion of the treadmill, which uh, I'm not going to go into that now, but it turns out that's kind of an equivalent problem to the faster than wind. Uh, but I won't go into that for now. But that's what they came up with, with this, I with this idea for proving that it was possible. And uh, so really, when you think about it, this is an engineering bet. This is a bet whether you have the skill to build this thing. Because just because you can't build something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So if they failed to build this thing, it would not mean that it's impossible to build. It just means that they didn't have the skill to build it. It has nothing to do with theoretics. Uh, and this brings up an interesting point, which is this. 
what is theoretically possible versus what is achievable by humans are, are two different things. For example, Einstein says it's impossible to go faster than the speed of light. That's a physical physics limit that can't be uh, exceeded. But he doesn't say you can't go half the speed of light, yet no humans have built a machine to go half the speed of light. Does that mean it's not possible? Or if I said, let's build a robot to play tennis as well as, <clears throat> as Roger, Federer does, Roger Federer does, could you do it? You would fail. We don't have the technology at this point. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. There's no theoretical reason why it's impossible. So, uh, so if you fail at something, that does not prove that it's not possible. So their bet really came down to whether his friend Zyla had the ability to do this scale model in her workshop and get it to work. It had nothing to do with the theoretics of the problem as to whether it's possible to go downwind faster than wind. With that said, I am now going to switch my presentation to proving myself in a very intuitive way that almost anybody can understand why it is possible to go downwind faster than wind. So um, when I first watched the Veritasiev videos, when he tried to explain how it was possible to go downwind faster than wind, I sort of understood it. I sort of didn't. It sort of made sense. But I didn't get this warm, fuzzy feeling that I really understood it in an intuitive sense, uh, you know, just like that aha thing, like where I really understood it. I really felt that I understood it. And so I tried to look at some other videos that tried to explain it. Like I looked at these two videos, and they're by uh, physicists. And they uh, also tried to explain it, but, but uh, you know what? Guess what? After I watched these videos, I was still confused. And uh, here is the problem. The explanations are complicated. They are full of math equations and physics. They're not intuitive. You want to get that intuitive sense that you understand, but you never do. And I'm thinking perhaps the physicists are so smart, they can't see through the forest through the trees. They cannot come down to our level. And when I mean our, I mean myself included. Although I have some physics background, and some math background. I'm no physicist, I'm no scientist, and I'm no genius, that's for sure. So uh, we need an explanation that we common people can understand. So I thought and thought and I thought, and what I realized what I needed was a paradigm shift. For those who don't know what a paradigm shift is, it's a dramatic change from one way of thinking to another. So I started to try to think in different ways. And then all of a sudden, I had it, my paradigm shift. And I understood intuitively why faster than wind is possible. So uh, I want to demonstrate the process of suddenly understanding something after a paradigm shift. I have a problem. I need to find out what's inside this box. But this box is made out of Trifamadorian titanium. It's the strongest material in the universe. I'm going to need you to order me some equipment. I'm going to need a magnetic resonance imaging machine and a computerized spectrometer, a triplex Doppler ultrasound machine, and that thing from my cousin Vinny, you know, the Hewlett Packard 5710A dual column gas chromatograph with flame analyzation detectors. Can you order that stuff for me? Oh, it's a light bulb. So that was a silly video that was meant to be hopefully a little bit humorous. But there's a serious point to be made. And that is this. Sometimes you look at something the wrong way you go down a rabbit hole, you keep on searching in the wrong direction. But if you change your point of view sometimes, all of a sudden the solution becomes obvious. So I'm now going to delve right into the solution as I see it, an intuitive understanding of this problem. Okay, I said we would not 
need much math or physics to understand my intuitive explanation, but we will need to understand Newton's three laws of motion, which I have simplified here, taking out any math equations that are in there. And Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion remains in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted upon by a force. And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about all three of these laws individually in a minute. Newton's second law of motion says if you apply a force to an object and that force is unopposed by any other force, the object will begin to accelerate and will continue to accelerate as long as the force is applied. And Newton's third law of motion says that for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So let's look at Newton's first law. Sometimes it's a little unintuitive on Earth because there's friction, a lot of friction here on Earth. You kick a box, the box goes forward for about five feet and then stops. You put it in motion, why didn't it remain in motion? Because there's a lot of friction and that box stops quickly. If we look at the case with a bowling ball, there's a lot less friction. When you throw a ball down a bowling alley, the ball is heavy, so not much wind resistance. The ball is hard, the alley is hard, so not much resistance there, and it would go for a long ways if we had a long enough bowling alley, but eventually it would stop. And if we look at this in space, then we can really see what Newton's first law really means. It will go on forever. In space, a meteor, a meteor hurtling through space will basically go on forever, thousands of years. Okay, so now let's look at, the, at Newton's second law. Newton's second law says if you apply a force to an object and that force is unopposed by any other force, the object will begin to accelerate and will continue to accelerate as long as the force is applied. And again, on Earth, that's confusing because if you have this little boy pushing this huge truck on Earth, he's not going to be able to push that truck because there's too much friction to the ground. But if you put that boy in space and he pushes that truck, the truck will begin to move and it will move. And, and gain speed and accelerate as long as that boy continues to push the truck. Um, so that's what would happen in space. But here on Earth, we, to make this happen, we have to get rid of the friction. And finally, Newton's third law states that if the boy pushed on the truck and the boy's feet were not held down by something, in space, the truck would go forward, but the boy would fly backward because for every action, there is an opposite an equal reaction. Okay, so we're almost there, just hang on. Let's talk about Blackbird's gearing. Now, Blackbird has wheels and a propeller and a chain. This chain physically attaches the wheels, the motion of the wheels, to the motion of the propeller. When the wheels go forward, it turns the axle, the axle turns a gear, which is attached to a chain, and the chain will turn the propeller and it turns it in a direction such that the wind goes backwards. This is the same way as what happens in a plane. The, the air goes backwards from the forward direction of the plane. Okay, so now let's visualize this situation. Everybody should be able to visualize this situation. Black, there's a wind speed of 10 miles an hour, and Blackbird is going down the road at 10 miles an hour. Everything is in equilibrium. Uh, and, and it's, easy to, uh, it's easy to visualize, it's easy, it's very intuitive. He's just going the same speed as the wind. Nobody can deny this, right? And uh, the thing to note here is that from the point of view of this driver sitting in the car, he feels no wind whatsoever. For him, the air is totally still. The wind is going 10 miles an hour. The vehicle is going 10 miles an hour. The wind feels totally still, okay? But as this car is sitting there with no wind around it from the car's point of view, we have the propeller is turning because the propellers are attached to the wheel and the wheel is turning so the propeller is turning and it's pushing air backwards. Let's say for example it's pushing the air five miles an hour backwards. Okay, That's creating a force backwards and we know that from the physics we just showed that uh, there's an opposite and equal reaction so whatever force is applied backwards the car will be, go with the same force forward. And we know that if there's no friction at all, that 
the car will start to accelerate in the forward direction. So it's very intuitive that the car will start to accelerate from this equilibrium position of 10 miles an hour and then will go over 10 miles an hour. If you want another visualization, consider the relative speeds of the different things in play here. The vehicle is going 10 miles an hour relative to the ground. The propeller wind speed relative to the vehicle is going backwards at 5 miles an hour. That means the propeller wind speed relative to the ground is going 5 miles an hour. The vehicle is going 10 miles an hour, but the air behind the propeller is only going 5 miles an hour relative to the ground. And the air wind speed is 10 miles an hour. So we can visualize this as follows. The car is going 10 miles an hour, but the wind behind the propeller is only going 5 miles an hour. So you can think of this as a wall of air, which is only going 5 miles an hour. But the air wind speed is 10 miles an hour. So this 10 mile an hour wind speed is pushing this wall of air, which is 5 miles an hour, and pushing it forward. And that is how the vehicle is able to accelerate. Well, it's been a long road to get to this point. I hope you enjoyed my video, and I hope you now understand uh, how it works visually, uh, intuitively, not with math equations, but just intuitively. And uh, the end. Thank you. Bye.